Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Hi, this is Mark Graben. Welcome to episode 263 of the podcast. It is September 21st, 2016. My guest today is another returning guest. I've had a lot of them recently, and he is Pascal Dennis. He was previously a guest on episodes 96 and 239, talking about two of his previous books. And you can find links to those episodes and all of these different books by going to leanblog.org 263. Now, today we're talking about Pascal's most recent book. It's a business novel called Andy and Me and the Hospital, Further Adventures on the Lean Journey. Now, I'm just, it, this is just me. I, I don't normally read much fiction. I read a lot of nonfiction. I generally don't read business novels. And I really enjoyed this book. I tore through it in a few days, a couple different flights and some other time. You know, the book was really compelling. Many of the scenarios felt um, quite familiar. And I think this is a very helpful book for painting a picture of what it could feel like to start a lean journey in healthcare. So again, this book is Andy and Me and the Hospital. The book is, of course, a sequel to Pascal's earlier book, Andy and Me, Crisis and Transformation on the Lean Journey. That book's now available in a second edition. So uh, I hope you enjoy the episode. It's always a pleasure to talk to Pascal. I've learned uh, so much from him over the years. I'm really happy to bring this to you today. Well, Pascal, it's uh, great to have you back on the podcast today talking about yet another new book. Thanks for joining us. It's always a pleasure, Mark. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so it was just in January we did episode 239 about Lean Production Simplified. Um, and today we're talking about a book that follows uh, a different series of yours, a different style, uh, a, a business novel. Can you for you know, maybe introduce for people the, the first book, Andy and Me, and how that story continues here in Andy and Me and the Hospital? Yeah, um, Andy and Me uh, is set in a... Uh dying uh, New Jersey auto factory and uh, the protagonist uh, uh, the plant manager is a guy in big trouble um, he's uh, losing his plant his uh, personal life is a train wreck and um, in desperation he seeks out this mysterious uh, reclusive uh, ex-Toyota uh, heavyweight who's living in uh, New Jersey of all places and the book is about um, how Andy and Tom uh, bring uh, the factory back to life uh, and also um, uh, bring themselves back to life, if you will. It's their relationship, the Sensei Deshi relationship uh, in that context. Um, uh, there's a second book called The Remedy, wherein they uh, work together to extend lean thinking, not just in manufacturing, but across an entire platform from you know, voice customer and clay model design all the way down to the dealerships. Uh, Andy and me in the hospital is their third adventure together, and uh, they're pulled into uh, a major New York City hospital. It's also in great uh, difficulty. Initially, Tom's uh, feeling is, well, hold on, I don't know a thing about hospitals. Why should I, uh, and how can I possibly help? But uh, circumstances take over, and uh, and they do take on the challenge. Yeah, and... You know, we're going to talk about that book today. I didn't mean to uh, to ignore uh, the remedy. I think the audio cut out when you were giving that title, so I want to make sure people know that second book in the series is called uh, the remedy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's funny. So you know, Tom and Andy, you know, you you express that question of well, you know, gosh, how how could I help in healthcare? I, I know I I had that same thought and same question in two thousand five when I got into healthcare. I I, I I know you, you've probably been there in your own personal uh, progression um, you know, with helping organizations with lean. Uh, and, and, and I think there's a similar question on the other side of that equation. The hospital's asking, well, how, you know, how can this engineer, this person from manufacturing help? Um, what, what are some of your thoughts or reflections on, on both sides of kind of coming to understand how somebody from manufacturing can help in healthcare? Um it's a great question. Uh, as you say, I think every manufacturing person needs to reflect on how does this, uh, you know, what Deming called a profound system of knowledge apply in other industries. Uh, and what I uh, realized is that uh, every industry entails a series of process 
you know, um, healthcare value streams, for example, begin with uh, registration of some kind and they conclude with uh, uh, discharge. And in between, there are various and complex process flows. Um, and the fundamentals of uh, uh, the Toyota system apply anytime there's a process. So um, there is a great deal of translation involved um, because uh, the demand profile, the uh, uh, supply, and related capability questions are very different in healthcare. But if uh, we trans the fundamental, um, I concluded that yeah, we can really help uh, uh, help these folks, and I was helped in that translation and understanding by my uh, late father-in-law, uh, the late great doctor Robert Gazelle, who um, who ran the biggest clinic in Ontario, and he was really interested in what. Uh, uh, the Lean Pathways team and I were doing, and he said, you know, this really does apply in healthcare. So he and I took several walks, you know, a decade ago through Oshawa General, and um, he began to, to help me uh, see how this might apply. And, um, you know, since then, uh, it's it's been a lot of fun, a great challenge. That translation is mm-hmm. a central theme in the book. It's not easy, uh, but if you can do it effectively, you can really help people. Yeah, and... What, what sort of what sort of discussions do you have when you know somebody from healthcare you know um, sort of raises that concern and you know there this, this plays out in in the book in in very I think recognizable and in, in realistic ways but what what's you know if, if somebody says you know well you know we're we're you know hospital is not a factory patients are not cars harumph harumph um, <laughs> Do, do you have people who, who have been, um, you know, maybe unwilling to even listen, or how do you try to engage those those folks to learn more? Um, I think um, the most important thing, the entry uh, chip, if you will, is to really understand um, healthcare. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, that means spend a lot of time in the Gemba with humility and uh, understand the technology, the flow, the culture. And uh, where it's different, because it's very different than manufacturing in a number of important ways. Learn the language of medicine, for example, in healthcare. And then at least people are open. They say, okay, this person has has tried to understand our business. And then um, uh, give them uh, examples of um, of application, ideally uh, a gamble walk in a, in a hospital that's further ahead. And have them talk to their peers, and uh, they start to realize, holy cow! You know, uh, the standardized work really does affect a registration process, or you know, good connections upstream and downstream really do re- reduce length of stay. Um, so uh, it's uh, uh, an iterative process. We call it drip, 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 drip. It begins with understanding and humility, uh, and. Uh, it entails a lot of um, iteration, a lot of repetition, and often you don't have the answers. You know, so for example, uh, in an uh, OR uh, a value stream, we, sus- we we suspect that level loading can be a very effective um, a countermeasure, but uh, until you experiment, until you understand the the nature of the obstacles and run some uh, some tests, you can't really. Uh, definitively answer how. Um, so it does take iteration, it takes humility and openness and if uh, the deshi, if the student is equally open, uh, then really good things happen. Yeah. But it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, and I think what you you know described there, you know, I hear the thought process of, of coming in Understanding. I mean, I, I, was it the uh, was it? I think one of the, the Stephen Covey Seven Habits: Seek first to understand. Um, yeah, which is an important part of um, you know, the lean problem solving model. Understanding the the situation, um, solving problems, iterating. That that's a different thought process than I think has been the tradition in healthcare, where where somebody, uh, often an executive, finds a best practice, they want to copy it, they force it on people. Um, it, they, you know, go implement this as opposed to iterating. And um, I mean, it seemed like that that's something that lean can contribute to hospitals is not just some of these specific what, you know, lean methods or tools, but but this thought process for problem solving. Right. Yeah, uh, that's such a great insight. I uh, 
I've worked with a lot of, you know, senior executives in healthcare, and and one of them uh, um, uh, shone a light for me into the the uh, core mental model with respect to change. And I, a very smart, very capable person, very well intentioned. But I realized, you know, over months of coaching, that his mental model and his background was accounting. His mental model uh, around change was um, click and drag. You know, he spends mm-hmm. a lot of time with Excel spreadsheets, so mm-hmm. you can click and drag and simply replicate uh, practice from one clinic to another clinic or from one OR to another OR. So it wasn't ill will at all. Right. Um, and I think that's very common as opposed to what you just described, a very, very yeah. different uh, mental model of change, you know. Yeah, and yeah, I think you're you're totally right. I mean, I've been impressed you know, people in healthcare, like you said, they're smart, they're capable, they're well-intended, whether we are talking about people working in processes um, directly with patients or, or leaders and executives. Um, but, you know, there, there's still, you know, a lot of, of problems. So, you know, there's one thing that was really, I think, you know, provocative in the book. One of the characters from that fictional Taylor Motors, which I assume comes from Frederick Taylor. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> the... Um, the, the the one of the characters there from that auto plant in New Jersey says the the worst Taylor factory is better managed than the the best hospital in America and and maybe that extends you know to to other countries that have similar management mindsets or models I mean can you kind of elaborate on you know what would be behind a statement like that Yeah well it, it is a strong statement but I think people familiar with uh, both industries will would support it. Um, take uh, General Motors or Ford or um, any major automotive company. They've been working on continuous improvement for decades now, and um, they make wonderful cars. Uh, they've had to compete with superb companies like Toyota and you know Audi, etc., for decades, and they would not have survived if they didn't get good at this stuff. Now, you could argue, well, you know, GM is not as good as Toyota. That, that's a debatable point. The point is that all boats have been, uh, have have risen greatly mm-hmm. because of the competitive pressure. So um, walk a, a, a typical automotive value stream and you'll see standardized work, a good understanding of content sequence time, expected outcome, good customer supplier relationships. So. Any major car plant at the end of the day, end of the shift, you'll you'll have uh, a stand-up meeting at, you know, what they call the money board, target, a thousand units. We made 950 within the allotted time. We missed 50 because of these reasons. The Pareto will be very clear, and the assignments uh, of the suppliers, welding, stamping, paint, etc., uh, will be very clear, and they'll come back and answer it. So that's a very tight uh, value stream. Very. Uh, intensely managed and uh, intense consciousness of problems. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't, they'd be out of business. Well, that simply does not exist today in most healthcare value streams. I think it will mm-hmm. exist in a decade, but right now, uh, it doesn't. N- you know, nobody, it, most people cannot answer the the most basic questions. Mm-hmm. What's today's work? Yeah. What's this week? Are we ahead? Are we behind? What are our top three problems? Who are our customers? What do they need? Have we boiled those down into Do we track them every day on a team board? You know, that's just how it is right now, uh, despite the, the skill, the intelligence, mm-hmm. uh, the capability of, uh, of folks in the value. Yeah, and I mean, it seems like, you know, there, there's that parallel again where, you know, you can have smart, capable, well-intended people and still have a bad system. I think, you know, whether that's at the process level or the management system level, I guess the good news is that we don't need people to get smarter. Um, but, but, uh, you know, it, it seems like sometimes that, that, that intelligence, those smarts become a barrier where people, I, I, I think are hesitant to admit, yeah, there's a problem with the system because our approach to this process or our way of management just sort of evolved. You know, it's really, it's nobody's fault, but yet, um, it seems like people, you know, uh, there's there's a lot of emotion that gets in the way of being able to recognize, like you say, problems are treasure, and that includes problems in the system, right? Yeah, exactly right. Um, there's so so much in, in what you said, Mark. One is uh, one point is that the more experienced and capable 
a person or a team is, the more likely they are to jump to a countermeasure mm -hmm. as opposed to doing what we described earlier, you know, articulating a hypothesis, finding root causes, confirming them through experimentation, and then locking in countermeasures with standard work. Uh, it's, it's less likely to happen if, you know, I'm a, a senior, you know, a practitioner in a hospital, I've done this forever, here's the answer, go do this. Mm -hmm. That just seems to be the default uh, uh, position, you know. Um, so we have a decade, decades worth of mental models to uh, to deepen and to extend, you know. Um, on the plus side, people are real smart, so once you show them and they lock it in, the change can happen quicker. I think it'll come quicker than it happened in, say, manufacturing mm -hmm. or aerospace, mm -hmm. but it is a steep curve. Yeah, and, you know, that, that idea of, you know, good people – bad process. Um, I think you articulate really well in the book what you call the great paradox of healthcare. Can you, yeah. I'll let you just articulate that. Um, yeah. Um, one of the characters, uh, Tom's brother in the book, who's a pharmacologist, describes this great paradox. He says, miracles happen within the silos. You know, many dise diseases have more or less been eradicated. Um, breast cancer, which used to be a death sentence, is now eminently treatable and people's mm -hmm. lives are longer and healthier, et cetera, et cetera. So within the silos, miracles happen, but across the silos, too often, catastrophe happens. Um, and the data is hard to uh, argue with. Every day, in effect, uh, a jumbo jet crashes in America. You know, 300 plus people die because of medical error. That's simply a fact. That's mm -hmm. the front page of the Wall Street Journal and the New Yorker and uh, you know, New York Times. It's not made up stuff. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, to solve that paradox, um, you know, I think we, we would be in agreement that means changing the management system and, and the culture. You know, so to that point, you know, I think there, there's two mental models that I think get challenged through lean. I'm, I'm curious if you have thoughts on convincing healthcare leaders or helping them understand uh, for, for one, um, you know, that lean is is not a layoffs cost cutting strategy as they've tr traditionally done. I think the mental model has been, oh well, labor is the biggest part of our cost structure, sixty to seventy percent. So therefore, we we should we we need to focus cost cutting there, and that means getting rid of people. Um, have, have you seen people make you know kind of a turnaround to seeing an alternative approach? Yeah, um, it's uh, a process. Uh, and it, there's several steps in the understanding, but at the end of uh, uh, the process, you know, very capable executives realize some basic things. For one, we do not understand what the work is. We don't know the work. We don't have standard work. We don't have the content, the sequence, mm -hmm. the time a given uh, task requires, a given job. Therefore, we don't know how many people we need. So we hire way too many people. And then we, when we run into financial difficulty, we lay a whole bunch of people mm -hmm. off. And this continual cycle, you know, uh, 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 this cycle just corrodes uh, morale. And uh, so people are confused, they're upset, they have no trust. So it's a proverbial vicious cycle. I mean, how can you possibly engage people in improvement uh, when you have this kind of whiplash? So once senior execs see that, they start to see, okay, well, let's understand what the work is. So that means basic uh, standardized work, basic uh, articulation, you know, involve our people. What is our work? What are the 10 critical processes in this uh, floor? Mm -hmm. And uh, then you can start to determine how many people you need. Okay, we we need this many people. Now, we don't have that many people. Okay, how do we increase our capacity? Well, ah, cross-training is possible and it enriches people so a different kind of a cycle can begin mm -hmm. um, but it's um, shi it, the, the, the sensei has to shine a light into, into a different mm -hmm. world a different way of thinking a different way of managing um, it takes time but it's worth it you know yeah. we always say if you can shift the senior leaders thinking a foot you can take the organization a mile mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. once they see it a door open opens and all sorts of great things happen. Yeah, and I think you, you make a great point of, you know, uh, maybe getting out of the realm of spreadsheets and going and understanding the actual work and, and looking for the, the what seems like endless 
quantities of waste. Um, you know, I just saw an article this morning about you know a small community hospital, um, you know, saving two and a half million dollars by improving their supply chain processes and material management yep. processes through Lean, which you know means not only just lower costs, but making sure people have what they need for patient care, which then has all sorts of other spillover effects, and you know, it goes far beyond the reduction in inventory, but, you know, it, it's, you know, it's just, it, it's frustrating to me to see organizations say things like, well, your leader, people say these things. Oh, uh, well, you know, we had no choice. Well, you just, you haven't, nobody has shown the light on the other opportunities to reduce waste in a way that's um, maybe less, less dysfunctional. Yeah. Well, I mean, building on your point, uh, a case uh, comes to mind, uh, it was a clinic, with really long length of stays and everybody agreed everybody knew obviously we have to expand we gotta mm -hmm. expand we need twice as many consultation rooms so they spent a fortune doubling the size of the clinic and mm -hmm. length of stay didn't change mm -hmm. in fact it got a little worse because um, the, the more rooms meant that the cycle time of key providers was higher because they had more rooms to to walk yeah. between um, when they realized that uh, the constraint was not the number of rooms, but the loading on their key resources, in this case, the physicians in the flow. You know, the utilization was uh, 95, 100 percent during peak uh, periods. They realized they'd entirely wasted uh, uh, their money. It was a complete mm -hmm. waste of money. And it was, you know, the hor horse had left the barn, but after the fact, they. Uh, managed to make really basic Kaizen to re reduce the utilization of the, the key servers and everybody was happier. The doctors were seeing more people with less hassle and uh, length of stay was reduced by half, you know, and uh, it was a memorable uh, quote. Was the director of the uh, clinic, he said, lean means don't be a dumbass, <laughs> you know, and that's quite a good summary, actually. Yeah, well, and, and I think it's... Um I, there, there's it makes me think of there's an expression sometimes people will say oh well uh, lean that's just common sense and you know, I forget who it was who said well you know common sense only seems so in hindsight because um, <laughs> a lot of th things about lean are unintuitive the way yep. you would go about improving flow in the book you touch on Little's law the idea that um, you know a core industrial engineering principle that others just haven't been taught that you know really high utilization might sound good but that really uh, is terrible for flow and causes all sorts of other problems. You know, that's, I think, unintuitive to people. And maybe, yeah. you know, if you will, the dumbassery uh, is only <laughs> is only clear in hindsight as well, right? Um, yeah. And uh, <laughs> you raise a great point, Mark. It's not <laughs> ill will or ineptness. <laughs> right. But if I'm a medical director or a, a senior nursing practitioner, I will not have learned the laws of uh, uh, production physics, you know, mm -hmm. Little's law, the law of utilization, the law of variation, mm -hmm. the basics, you know, theory of constraints, um, uh, you know, the fundamentals that uh, that other industries might uh, might think second nature. So how mm -hmm. could I possibly improve flow? I'm more likely to jump to a countermeasure such as let's double the size of the clinic mm -hmm. at great cost and and end up with even higher length of stays. You know, mm -hmm. that's. It's not ill will, but mm -hmm. uh, it, the effect is not good. So yeah. we have to learn these things in healthcare. Yeah, and and I mean, like you said, it's usually not a matter of ill will. I've seen this, you know, kind of at the process and value stream level. Department, you know, the the laboratory points fingers at the emergency department, and the emergency department blames the lab. And there's no ill will. There's often just a lack of understanding about how the entire process works. It sounds like, you know, the, you know, the, the silos are doing well, but, you know, to, to use your language of, of this great paradox, there's catastrophe across the departments. It's not, it's not ill will. Um, but I think, you know, the second thing I wanted to ask you about, you know, sort of helping convince leaders, or I think you say it better, shine a light to help them see, you know, I think the old mental model, which again, not born out of ill will, is this idea that the problem is the employees. And, you know, th that usually doesn't get said real directly, but I think it, it becomes sort of evident when uh, leaders think lean is all about training the staff as if, well, the, the, you know, the, we'll, we'll fix the staff and they won't be wasteful as opposed to you know, uh, learning and, and practicing lean themselves. How, how have you helped shine that light to help leaders see this isn't 
yeah, this, this this is about everybody maybe trying a new way of doing things. Uh, that's a that's such a great question. Um, a common mental model that I see uh, among senior leaders, especially, is that empowerment, quote unquote, uh, entails leaving it up to the front line. Mm-hmm. It's your show. One of the characters in in the book talks about that. I tell my people, it's your show. Well, that's not empowerment. That's abandonment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the senior leader's uh, uh, job is to ensure there's a good management system, which means at the very basic uh, level one, level two, level three checking, a good understanding uh, of uh, the basic uh, value streams, lines of care, um, you know, uh, provision of, of core training so people have uh, uh, a good understanding and provision of, of time for people to apply the learning. So humane uh, team member to team leader ratios um, and uh, a supportive culture. You know, uh, problems are gold. The problem is in the process. It's five whys, not five whos. You know, a policy of not blaming uh, people because almost always uh, – uh, the, the problem is in the process. So this entails um, building a culture that supports a management system that makes problems visible, and uh, we accept the responsibility to uh, you know, give people the, uh, the skills and, and the time to fix the problems. It, it's a very different model mm-hmm. than, you know, it's your show. Yeah. Well, it's your show, but so here I am. I'm a, I'm a charge nurse or a senior uh, director with 50 direct reports. It's your show. And yeah, you know, also we want you to do quality imp- uh, improvement, you know, and process improvement. Well, it's not realistic, you know. Yeah, and I think there's you know a common theme. Um, you know, people who have a background at Toyota, like yourself. Um, you know, John Shook will talk about how lean is neither. Yeah, you know, it's it's not completely top down. It's not completely bottom up. It's not laissez faire empowerment. It's working together and. Um, Daryl Wilburn, who worked at um, the San Antonio plant and, and, and maybe Kentucky before then, you know, I saw him speak at a conference recently where he talked about the ob- it's different this different mental model, the obligation of leaders to help provide a good system in which people can be successful. Um, I think a lot yeah. of a lot of leaders don't feel that sense of whether you call it accountability or responsibility to do that. They they they. They say, "Hey, you're empowered. I'm going to demand results, and if you don't get results, well, then shame on you." And that that's that's a totally different mental model, I think. It is indeed. It's uh, really um, a permutation of the old uh, management by objectives mm-hmm. mental model. Mm-hmm. You all get results. I don't care how you do it. Don't give me any bad news. As yeah. opposed to my job is to uh, build a management system, create a culture, uh, etc. It's a very different uh, uh, model and it, it requires a higher level of responsibility of leaders and failing to do that is, uh, is a leadership failure, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, well, you know. Yeah, and, and the book does a really good job of making that, um, you know, drawing out those distinctions as p- characters in the book are talking and, and discussing all of this. Um, you know that that's one of the I think highlights of the book. But you know to you know talk about um, you know something that's not just top down or bottom up. Um, if we think in terms of catch ball, and it makes me think of strategy deployment. Can you talk a little bit about the idea of of true north? You know how how is that true north statement different than you know most organiz- I think every organization at this point has what they would call their mission, vision, and value statement. How how is true north different? Why is it important? To, to sort of get agreement around what that means. So uh, True North is informed by mission, uh, value statement, etc. cetera, um, but it's a condensation. It's uh, normally um, a handful of goals. Uh, organizations like ThetaCare use a triangle, and you know, they've got four focus areas, and for each one, uh, there's a goal or two. So, um, you know, for example, uh, service delivery, patient safety and quality, affordability, people, might be the four focus areas, one or two uh, metrics there. So now we have a clear image of what success looks like. We know if we're winning or losing. Um, often there's also a few words that uh, define who we are, what we believe in. Uh, those words are called a hoshin in Japanese, and uh, they speak to the heart. So something for the head, the hard metrics, and something for the heart. I remember uh, one organization uh, after, you know, really heart-rending, emotional 
a reflection with senior leaders came up with two words that expressed who they are, affordable excellence. That's who we are. We are committed to our community. We're a safety net hospital. And we're about affordable excellence. And they had a, a collages of photographs going back 40, 50, 60 years uh, uh, that reflected uh, their commitment. In any event, um, it's important to boil things down to uh, a clear definition of purpose that we call true north um, because uh, constancy of purpose is probably the greatest uh, enabler of all. Mm -hmm. uh, that was Deming's uh, mm -hmm. first point. And um, strategic uh, history, military history in particular, teaches us that if we do not define purpose clearly, um, we're in trouble. Right. You can literally win every battle, but but fail to lose, uh, but fail to win the war. You know, if I can use uh, that metaphor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, true north is a statement of purpose. It is the single most important job of the leader. Failing to do that leaves us at sea. Um, one other thing I want to talk about in terms of strategy deployment, you know, when you have the true north and, and, and measures and goals, you know, in the book you, you talk about, um, you know, a quick and easy Kaizen process, staff driven uh, idea boards. How do you see that fitting in with the alignment that we're trying to get through strategy deployment? You know, I recently heard one hospital leader, um, you know, say at a conference that, well, you know, our staff only work on things that fit into the strategy deployment areas and, and my fear from that is that they'll they'll stifle participation if they don't let people um, you know Masaki and I uh, you know in his book Kaizen would always you know give the advice at some point you got to let people work on what they want to work on because otherwise you'll you'll start to see crossed arms and and people not wanting to participate How, what are your thoughts on trying to strike that balance between you know having alignment but not stifling participation yeah I think that's a great point and I'm a, I'm a great uh, a fan of uh, uh, Imai san the uh, the metaphor um, that I articulate in the book uh, is uh, the river metaphor so the the senior leader's job is to define purpose or true north in the way we just described and then define um, what I call the banks of the river our design space you know we you know for example service quality patient uh, safety and quality, affordability, people, you know, three or four focus areas, and then stand back and let people at it, you know, and don't correct them if they're a little bit off to one side or the other side, so long as they're more or less within the banks of the river and flowing towards true north, flowing to the sea, if you will, you're okay. Uh, the single most important thing, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Emi would agree, is total involvement, mm -hmm. you know. Um, once you have that, all sorts of good things happen, but anything that stifles that uh, is very bad. So initially, you want to go for volume. You know, the first three mm -hmm. to five years, go for volume of involvement, all eyes looking for improvement. And yeah, uh, people will find reasonable things. You know, uh, direct uh, the involvement in the way I described, you know, this banks of the river metaphor. Um, but get out of the way. You know, most important, remove obstacles. Mm -hmm. Take away hassles. You know, take away anxiety, fear, um, and good things will happen. So um, we talk about you know, kind of the, the the banks of the river and different approaches. You know, there there are all sorts of different models and approaches for trying to help transform an organization. I'll, I'll very intentionally try to. Um, I was trying to avoid the terminology to, to implement lean, which, which I, I've sort of come to not really care for that term for a number of reasons. But, you know, in the book, here, here. the, uh, yeah, the, uh, here, the characters, uh, you know, Tom and, and the others sort of poo-poo that, you know, this fictional hospital had been, or maybe they're talking about other hospitals, were, you know, um, dabbling with lean. And, and there was this phrase, you know, that there was just these scavenger hunts for waste. I mean, how, how would you define those terms and and why did those approaches sometimes cause problems well um lean is about creating value uh that's the opening and end point of lean it's about creating value so um if our activities uh, are, are organized and informed by value we end up in a good spot so um, the most basic expression of that is a given unit, uh, let's say the blood bank, uh, must ask who depends on us, who are our customers, obviously the patient, what does the patient need, and 
obviously the operating rooms and uh, the emergency department, etc. So now we understand who depends on us, who are our customers, if you will. Now, what do you all need from us? And that requires an openness, a humility, a back and forth quality. Now we understand what you need from us. Now, what are our critical processes for um, providing that? And what are the critical few metrics that will tell us whether we're okay and not okay? And how do we uh, ensure regular feedback? So we'll have a daily stand-up meeting and wherein we review how we're doing against uh, our critical metrics. And uh, you know what? Once a week, we're going to invite our customers to our stand-up meeting and ask, uh, and ask them how we're doing. Um, so uh, that is a very different approach than uh, a scavenger hunt. Uh, here's a check sheet, everybody go out and look for waste. Well, you'll find waste, but you may not create value. You may find trivial waste. It's mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. every waste is created equal. I remember one contract electronics manufacturer we were working with, they had set arbitrary um, work in process targets. No part shall uh, be kept greater than two weeks. Uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have no more than two weeks uh, uh, of any part uh, in our uh, sites. And they ended up running out of uh, a five cent uh, resistor oh. uh, and short shipping uh, Cisco systems, you know, multi million dollar penalty. So, did they find waste? Yeah. Was it important? <laughs> well, it was not important in the big scheme of things, but it, it did lead to a catastrophic result. So, lean is not a scavenger hunt for waste, it's about creating value. And uh, that's a very, very different uh, approach. Of course, you do triage. Of, you identify different kinds of waste, and you say these two or three are critical because they're preventing us from creating value for our customers. It's mm -hmm. an entirely different uh, approach and understanding, you know. Yeah. Well, and I think you know, a scavenger hunt for waste may ignore some of the important issues that you've brought up. That I think again go back to Dr. Deming, uh, eliminating fear in the organization, um, you know, that, that waste walks could be used in, uh, you know, unfortunately punitive ways, uh, yeah. you know, find the waste and we can make you feel bad for it instead of, um, you know, a more, uh, instead of having the right mindsets and mental models, I guess. Oh yeah. And, um, uh, sadly you see it, for example, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that healthcare value streams are different in important ways, and one of those differences is in the structure of demand. So, an emergency department, for example, has a very different demand profile than, you know, a manufacturing process. And because of that wide uh, variation in demand, it's a typically a Poisson distribution. You know, all over the place, a very high coefficient of variance. Um, you need to build in. Um, some capacity buffers so you don't want to load your jobs up to our earlier point above a certain point you don't want people to be loaded above 80 percent for example mm -hmm. otherwise you get explosive increases in length of stay but if you're doing a waste walk and you see a team and they're not doing something at this <laughs> moment you say oh well you know there's waste there's delay waste let's load them up <laughs> which <laughs> right. is the absolute worst thing to do because mm -hmm. now their utilization goes above 80 percent and length of stay can easily double or triple uh so it, it can actually be counterproductive <laughs> yeah and i think it comes back to your point of not um all waste is created equally i mean i think i'm you know, hearkening back to it's probably you know ono or shingo or, or both of their books saying you know uh, too many managers walk around and look for the person who's not busy instead of looking for the product that's not flowing. And I think the parallel yeah. to the health to healthcare is, you know, leaders may walk around and get really angry at like that that employee doesn't look busy, but they don't get angry about the patient <laughs> sitting there and not flowing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's a great way of putting it. Um you, you need to build in um capacity buffers in value streams with very high levels of demand variation. That's just how it is. And mm -hmm. a, a Toyota would do it mm -hmm. in a heartbeat. Yeah. You know, typically uh, toward the end of our lines uh, uh, in Toyota, we would um, load the jobs up less. See, we'd build in yeah. that capacity buffer because uh, we respect the uh, uh, law of variation and uh, uh, the laws of flow. You know, uh, to, to your point, we have to understand these laws. And then that gives us a totally different understanding of healthcare uh, value streams. And we make decisions that will be very, very different. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Well, we'll wrap up here and, and, and talk a little bit more uh, about the book. Again, it's Andy and me in the hospital. Uh, really, I really enjoyed the book. I think we've we've chatted about this before. You know, I, I generally don't read fiction. And so business novels often just don't don't draw me in. This book totally drew me in. Maybe it's because you. The, these, you. You know, the scenarios were realistic and compelling. And I mean, it was uh, it was it was a page turner. And I, I appreciate the uh, you know the kind of the the reflection that the book um, you know it, it really really made me think and so I'm curious you know what, how do you think the book is is being being used I'm sure there are readers who maybe you know have a good deal of experience with lean there may be readers where this is their first exposure um, how, have you gotten feedback I know it's just newly out you know of how people are using it or how do you hope people would use the book. Well, I've gotten um, you know very encouraging feedback. You know, senior uh, senseis have written me saying, "This is great. I I, I want to give this book to all, all the senior leaders in in all our major engagements." So um, I think one way is uh, as uh, as a learning tool. Uh, I'm I'm hopeful that that'll uh, extend not just to senior leaders, but uh, to, to frontline uh, leaders and frontline team members. Uh, um, there are questions at the end of every chapter. Uh, I'm hopeful that people will have study groups and maybe you know read a chapter a week and then uh, come together and discuss the questions. Uh, uh, they're not easy questions and no. uh, they require a lot of reflection and and humility. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, the book will also help trigger go see activity. And you know it's uh, meant to be not just a, 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 a movie of. Uh, a lean transformation, but also a primer in a lean fundamentals uh, apply in healthcare. So hopefully, people will use it to teach standardized work or visual management or quality in the process or you know the uh, the principles and laws of flow. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you know there there are a lot of great lessons um, to be drawn from the book. If if somebody is an executive or uh, a lean facilitator or a frontline manager. Um, I mean, there, there really is something for everybody and to maybe even think, ha, prompt people to think about how those different parts of the organization fit together. If they're, if they're not getting exposure to that on a daily basis, um, hopefully the book will spark some of those conversations and, 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 you know, shine light, as you said, on the different perspectives, um, you know, so that frontline staff aren't blaming their executives, different departments aren't blaming each other. Um, hopefully those discussions help uh, open people's eyes and move things forward. So um, thank you, Pascal, for uh, for the book and, and for your continued work and teaching. Um, what, what do you recommend? How can people learn about the book? How could they find you online? Um, to uh, access the book, uh, productivitypress.com or amazon.com. Um, to uh, learn more about uh, uh, myself, if you're so inclined, uh, Lean Systems, all one word, dot org. LeanSystems.org is uh, our website. Please uh, enjoy the blog. Um, I try to blog as often as I can, and you know, there's downloadable stuff, and there's the Twitter feed, etc. So, um, uh, you know, uh, my job is to, in some small way, uh, do for folks what the Japanese uh, did mm. for me. So. Uh, uh, please feel free to, to use all those resources. Again, uh, leansystems.org or productivitypress.com or you can check my amazon.com page, Pascal Dennis. Well, I certainly encourage everyone to do that and um, to, to check out the book and um, connect uh, with Pascal. Your, your Twitter feed is full of, of little short Zen thoughts and moments. <laughs> I, uh, you, you, Thank you. You're making good use of Twitter and um, so thank you for that. So again, our, our guest today has been Pascal Dennis, uh, his most recent book, Andy and Me in the Hospital. Thank you so much for uh, taking time to talk with us today. It's always a pleasure, Mark. Keep up the good work. I'm an avid follower of Lean Blog and all your superb Twitter feeds. So folks, please continue to support Mark as well. Oh, thank you. It's very kind. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily, visit www.leanblog.org. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com.